In this third part of module one, we're going to talk a little bit about memory, how memory works and what actually happens when you declare variables and when you make objects in Java. The reason we're talking about this is because a lot of the data structures we're going to learn and deal with sort of rely on setting up memory in such a way to use it effectively. And so we need to really understand what is happening with references and what is happening with variables and what is actually being stored in the computer when you do these things like declare variables and allocate memory and things like that. So we're going to take a little bit of a closer look than you probably have in the past at the way that memory works and the way that it interacts. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. All right, so like I said, we're going to talk a little bit in more detail about the way that memory works, how do references work, and how are things actually laid out. Now this might be a little bit of review for some of you, but I want to make sure we went over it to make sure that we're all on the same page and we all have the same kind of base level understanding of what's happening inside our programs. All right, so let's begin with a small little riddle. We have this little class called person which stores details about a person. It stores their name, which is a string. It stores the year that they were born as an integer. And then it stores their best friend, which is another person. And now the question is, how does this thing actually get stored in memory? Well, we might think that we start by making a box for our object. So let's say we created a person and inside of that we have the string which is going to store inside of that whatever their name is let's say their name is joe then inside of this we also have the birth year and inside of the birth year it's going to store the year they were born let's say 1998 and then we have their best friend and that is a person object so inside of the person object we have to make the string for their name and let's say the Joe's best friend is Beth. And Beth's birth year is 1997. And now Beth's best friend also is a person object. So inside of that person object, we're going to have to have a name and we're going to have a birth year and we're also going to have to have a best friend. And inside of that object, and so you can see that this is clearly going wrong because there's not going to be any end to this. Because if a person object stores a person object inside of it, then we're going to get this sort of like infinite loop of putting a person into a person into a person into a person. And so clearly this is not the way that it actually works. It doesn't actually store the objects like this. So this doesn't work and doesn't make sense. So how is it actually done? It's actually done with references. Whenever you store, or rather, whenever you declare a class type in Java, it does not actually make space for that object to exist. Instead, it just creates a reference to it. So the way that a person would actually be created is like this. We'd have our person, then we'd have the name field. And because a string is a class type in Java, it doesn't actually store the object inside of person. It doesn't actually store Joe within the confines of the person objects that we create. Instead, what it does is it stores an eight byte reference, which could refer to the object somewhere else. Likewise, when we have the best friend field, it doesn't actually put the person inside of here because as we just saw, that leads to almost like a paradoxical thing where the person has a person and so on. Instead, it kind of short circuits that by just storing a reference to the person, which has to exist somewhere outside of the person object we're creating. And then lastly, we had, what was it? The birth year. The birth year is a little bit different because it's just an integer. The primitive types, which just to remind you are things like this, int or double or float or char and what have you, Boolean, those things are stored directly. So if Joe was born in 1998, the 1998 would be stored directly inside of the person object because it's just a four byte integer. Whereas the object types, this string here and this person here are references to somewhere else. So it doesn't look like this in memory. It actually looks more like this in memory. 
The birth year, like I said, will be four bytes and it could store something like 1997. It will store the name, which is an eight byte reference, and it will store the best friend, which is another eight byte reference. Now these references are also called pointers and they're usually called references in Java with one exception, which I'll mention in a second. Um, they're more often called pointers in other languages like C and C++, which I am actually have a lot more experience with, so I'm, I might tend to call them pointers, but a pointer and a reference is the same thing. Essentially what it is, is it's a variable that instead of directly storing the value, it instead stores the address of where the actual value is in memory. Now references are initialized to null, which is usually implemented as just the memory address zero. So if you make a person object and you set the birth year to 1997, but you don't set the name or the best friend yet, it will look like this in memory. Four bytes storing 1997, eight bytes storing zero, and another eight bytes storing zero. So in order to actually have these fields, the name field and the best friend field refer to something, we have to actually instantiate objects. So let's take a look at an example that does that. Here we have an example where we have this person object, which also has a constructor and the constructor takes the name and the birth year and it just assigns them in here. So it goes ahead and, um, sets the birth year equal to the birth year. That's just an integer, so it's just copied over. Then we have the name, which is set equal to a new string, and it copies this name in here. Then we also have a set best friend method, which takes the friend and it copies it into this best friend field. Then inside of the main, or the main method, rather, we make two persons. One is Alice Anderson from 1997, and the other is Bill Barber from 1998. And then we set them as each other's best friend. So let's take a look at what is actually happening when we run code like this, sort of under the hood, the memory view of this. All right, let's look at this first line of main that makes Alice Anderson as P1. Well, that's going to make a person object. Whenever you have this new right here, basically that makes an object in memory and puts all of the fields inside of there. So P1 is going to exist somewhere in memory. We don't usually know or care what addresses our objects are stored in. And so usually we don't talk about addresses at all, but just to make this a little bit more tangible and concrete, I'm going to make up an address that it could be stored at. So let's say P1 is stored at address 82,000. Totally arbitrary. It would certainly not be that if you actually ran this program, but it's just an example number. So P1 is stored at 82,000. And inside of there, we have a few fields. We have the birth year, which is equal to 1997. And that is actually going to be stored inside of there as a four byte integer. Then we also have the name, which is set to Alice Anderson. Now the name, because it's an object type, is not actually going to be stored inside of here. Instead, it's going to be a reference to the name which exists somewhere else. And so when we create Alice Anderson like this, somewhere out in memory will be a string object actually storing the bytes Alice Anderson. And this object might store other stuff like the length and who knows what else, we don't really know or care but somewhere this string is going to be stored. So let's say that this is stored at, I don't know, 91,500, it doesn't matter. Now what happens actually is that this 91,500 is what is actually stored inside of the P1 box. Person one here doesn't store the name Alice Anderson inside of it directly. Instead, it stores a reference to it which is implemented with storing the actual memory address where the object containing Alice Anderson actually lives in memory. That's why it's called a reference. It doesn't actually store what is supposed to be stored. Instead, it just refers to someplace else that it's storing it. All right, and then the last field, the best friend field is uninitialized at this point. So it's going to be set equal to zero.
Now, what would happen if right here after this line of code, we went ahead and we did something like printing p1.bestfriend? What would happen is we would get the famous null pointer exception, which you've all, I'm sure, seen in Java several times. Now, this is one place that Java actually calls it a pointer instead of a reference. Again, they're exactly the same thing. So our pointer at this point, our reference is null. It doesn't actually store anything. All right, so let's move on to the next line of code. This makes an object storing Bill Barber from 1998. So when we have this new, it's going to make another object box storing P2. And let's say that this is a, at, I don't know, 68,012. Again, totally arbitrary. Now this is also going to have a birth year, which gets set to 1998. It's also going to have a name. And just like with Alice, Bill Barber's name is actually going to exist somewhere else in memory. 1250, whatever. And Bill Barber <laughs> is going to be stored inside of that box instead. And just like Alice, instead of having the name actually store the letters inside of the box P2, it's just going to store the address like this. Then likewise, the best friend is going to start off equal to zero. So hopefully that is making sense so far. The next thing that happens in this code is p1.setfriend of p2. So here we take p2, the reference to it, which is in fact this memory address, and we pass it into p1's set friend method, which just stores it inside of the private variable best friend. So what happens then is essentially we're going to set p1's best friend reference. Instead of null, it's going to refer to 68,012, which is the address of p2 in memory. Then we do the same thing the other way. We pass the p1 reference into p 2 set friend method. And so P2's best friend field, rather than being null, is instead going to store the memory address 82,000. So after this program is done and gets to the end of it, this is the picture of what is happening in memory. We have four objects which have been created, two string objects and two person objects. The person objects store an integer directly and they store two references indirectly. The name, which is linked by the address that is in the reference field, and also the best friend, which is also stored indirectly in this best friend reference, referring essentially these two objects to each other. Okay, now hopefully that makes sense. That's what a reference is, is that it's a address of something else in memory. Now, like I said, we don't ever really know or frankly care what actual addresses things are stored in in memory. And so most of the time, we're not going to draw these diagrams like this at all, where we fill in make-believe memory addresses because that's kind of a waste of time to come up with them and keep them straight. Instead, what we're going to do is we're just going to symbolize what objects, or rather what references refer to what objects with arrows. All right, so rather than having name store the memory address that we made up of where the string is, instead we're just gonna draw a diagram like this, like this, to symbolize that we don't know exactly where Alice Anderson's string object is being stored in memory, but wherever it is, the address is put in this name field. This arrow indicates that. Likewise, this name field is going to point over here to the Bill Barber string object, this best friend reference is going to point to this object, and this best friend reference is going to point to this object. Likewise, P1 is a reference as well. It points here, and P2 is a reference which points here. So that's why these reference variables are also sometimes called pointers, because they literally point at what the object whose address they store is. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. We're going to have lots of practice with references and with storing these memory addresses as we go along. A lot of our data structures like graphs and trees and link lists are going to be really, really based on this technique. Next, we're gonna talk about the difference between stack memory and heap memory. So when you make variables and objects in Java, 
there's actually two different places that they can go. One is the stack and one is the heap. They store different types of objects. You don't get to like choose where each type of thing goes. The stack is allocated automatically. You don't have to do anything to make that happen. Whereas the heap is allocated with new. So if you just say like int x equals five, that goes on the stack. If you say something is a new object and call its constructor, that goes on the heap. The stack only stores primitives and references and stack variables have names. Heap objects are only objects. Um, whenever you make an object, whether it's a string or a scanner or a person or whatever, it goes on the heap. And perhaps confusingly, but I hope you'll understand this, heap objects are actually anonymous. They don't actually have any kind of permanent name at all. Stack objects are destroyed at the end of the scope, and we'll talk about what that means, whereas heap objects are destroyed when they're not referred to anymore. So to go through this, let's look at an example program. This program makes a scanner, then it asks the user if they want rock, paper, or scissors. It gets the user's choice with nextint. Then it makes a random number generator with the random class. Then it finds the computer's choice by picking a random number. And then we have a little switch statement that prints out the winner. So let's talk about the objects that are being used inside of this program. The first line of code makes a scanner called in and sets it equal to a new object. Now this is actually making two different things. Even though you normally think of this as one thing, there's actually two things happening here. So on the stack, we have a reference called in. Then on the heap, we have an, an anonymous object, which is the scanner. And in is set equal to this new object. So we're going to say that in refers to or points to this scanner that was created on the heap. Now you might think that this is being sort of like needlessly pedantic to say there's actually two things, but as we'll see when we start talking about the details of how things like linked list or binary search tree nodes are laid out, it's going to be important that we understand it at this level of detail. So there's actually two things, like I said, in refers to this object here, even though normally you would think of it as one thing. Then we make this variable called user and set it equal to whatever in gives us as our next integer. So this will make user equals to, I don't know, let's say we pick two. Now this is a primitive variable, so it is only a stack variable. So again, things on the stack are primitives or references only, and they have names, whereas things on the heap actually do not. All right, in our code, the next thing that happens is we make a new random object um, of class random and set it equal to a reference called RNG. So again, this makes two things happen. It makes RNG as a stack variable, then it creates a random object on the heap and refers RNG to that object that we just made. Next, we are going to make a variable called comp, which is equal to a randomly chosen number from this random number generator. And let's say it's one, I don't know. Then we make a variable called difference, which is equal to user minor minus comp, which in this case, I guess would be equal to one. And then we go ahead and print out that the user won based on the logic of rock, paper, scissors. You can figure out if that's right or not, but this is what's happening inside of this code as we run it. So the stack has one, two, three, four, five variables, and the heap has two variables. Now, these things are in this case destroyed at the same time. What happens is that as we return from this method here, I guess this one, what's going to happen is all of these variables on the stack are going to be destroyed. So all of these things on the stack go away. Then we'll see that there are no more references to these objects on the heap, and so they will be destroyed as well.
We'll talk more about the heap and the stack as we go along. This example kind of just gives you an example of each of both types of object. Okay, so next we'll talk a little bit about stack frames. So every time you call a method, you get what's called a stack frame created for the method. The stack frame stores all of the variables and parameters and return values and everything else that is needed for that method. So here we have sort of a toy example, but we have four methods in this class, F, G, H, and main. So the first thing that happens is we're going to call main. So when you call main, you're going to make a stack frame for main. And all of the variables inside of it will be created. In this case, we only have one variable, which is args, which we talked about last time, which is an array, in fact. The thing that we do in main is to call upon the method h and pass 7 to it. So that makes a new stack frame for the method h. h has one variable x, which is equal to 7. And so as this is why it's called a stack, we're going to talk about stacks in more detail in a few weeks here. But a stack is basically a thing that like piles on top of each other, just like a stack of anything, a stack of plates, a stack of cards or whatever. So inside of H, we have this one variable X, which is equal to seven. H calls G and that causes another stack frame to be created for G. So every time you call a method, no matter what it does, a new stack frame is created on top of your stack for storing all the variables that that method might create. So G, only stores one variable, which is also called x, and it gets the value twice of what h's x was, so 14. Now, it doesn't matter, it doesn't cause any problem that these things are both called x. Methods can have variables of the same name, and the reason that that works and doesn't cause any confusion is because they're in totally separate stack frames. Now, what g does is it calls f, and f also has only one variable, which is called x, and which in this case is equal to 15, because it's 1 plus what g's x was. Now the variable f, or rather the method f, only does one thing, call system.out.println, which is in fact a method, and so that will get a stack frame as well. And who knows what is stored inside of the print line method. It probably has local variables inside of it. Who knows? But at that point, what's going to happen is this is going to cause 15 to be printed out onto the terminal screen. Then the methods start returning. So we called these in main h, g, f, print line order, but they're going to return back the other order. And what happens then is they get taken off of the stack. So the first thing that will happen is print is removed from the stack like that, and we go back to f. Then F is removed from the stack, and we go back to G. Then G is removed from the stack, and then H is removed from the stack. And at each step, the variables that are stored in the stack are removed and taken out of memory. So that is what was meant when it said earlier that variables on the stack are removed or deleted when they go out of scope. So as soon as the method returns, there's no way that you can access those variables anymore, and so that's when they are deleted. And so eventually we get back to main, and then when main returns, the program ends. So the stack kind of grows and then shrinks as the program is run. So this stack is maintained for us. When you call methods, it automatically makes a stack frame. And so we don't have to worry about it very often, but it will become important when we start talking about recursion, because in recursion, you sort of take advantage of the fact that you can have multiple copies of the same variables inside of your stack frames. It's also just really important that we know what is being stored on the stack and what is being stored on the heap. So now I'll just talk real quick about a couple of common memory mistakes that people make. The first is null pointer exceptions, where we already kind of talked about this. If you make a person like this and just say person p, that does not actually make an object. That just makes a reference to an object. And again, oftentimes, especially when you're starting, you think of those as the same thing. You think, oh, I made an object when I said scanner in equals new scanner. 
but really you did two things. You made a reference and you also happened to make an object and refer the reference to that object, but you could do both things separately too. And here we just made a reference. We did not actually make an object. So what happens is that reference refers to null. And if you do this, you will get a null pointer exception. So that's the important thing. Variables are just references and not objects themselves. Here's another example of this causing a problem. Let's look at this code for a second and see if you can figure out what is going to happen when we print it. We make a person called default person and set it equal to a new person with a default name born in 1990. Then we fill an array of eight person objects with the default person. So basically this is to like initialize all of the slots in the array one by one to a default person. And then we go through and set the name afterwards to be what we actually want. Think about this for a second. So we make a default person with the default information. Then we fill it into every slot of the array, which stores our persons, our person objects. Then we go through and we set the name of each one to a different thing and then the name at the end. So here it is, make this bigger, in a Vim instance here. So we have our person, which has a constructor, set name and print name. Then again, we make an array of person objects, a default person, and then set the default person into every slot of the array. Then we try to change the name to be something different for each one. And then we print the name of the first one. So this should print Alice if our thinking that led to this program was correct. But let's see what actually happens. Oops. Java C, called it person fail. So that's kind of a spoiler that this is not gonna work right. And if we run this, we actually get Hubert as the output, which is the name of the last person. So somehow person zero's name got sent to the same thing as person seven's name. And if we think about this, what is actually happening when we run the code is as follows. We make an array of eight persons, but again, these are not actual person objects. These are just person references. So when we make this array like this of eight things, we are not storing eight individual persons. We are just storing references that are going to refer to another person object. The only actual person that we make is here. Remember, this is just a reference. This is just references. This is the only actual person that gets created. So what happens is we have somewhere out in the heap, this person thing, which gets the name default and the birth year 1990. And then what we do in this for loop is we copy this reference into every slot of the array. So there's only actually ever one person and all of the slots of the array are just referring to that one same person over and all, over and over again. All of them refer here. And so what happens then when we go through and we say array zero dot set name Alice is we overwrite this with Alice. And then when we set the name to Billy here, we go ahead and we overwrite this with Billy and so on and so forth. Every time we change the name, we're changing the name of the one and only person object we ever actually made. And so at the end, when we print array zero's name, it's gonna be Hubert because they all refer to the same person who we've now set the name of to Hubert. So that's why this isn't working. And again, so many problems in Java are caused by kind of like not understanding what is a reference and what is an object. So hopefully that makes some sense now. If it doesn't, always please feel free to ask me questions about anything. But as we go through the semester, I think this will become more and more clear as we talk about intentionally creating references and referring them to certain objects. That's all for this lesson. This was sort of a heady one on references and memory. Some of it probably was somewhat review, but hopefully these ideas are sort of clear in your mind as we go forward. And again, if they're not, they, they probably will become clear, but please don't hesitate to ask me any questions that you might have about this. All right, I'll see y'all next time. Thanks.